Common minor Freunde to the one blast from the past that won't horrify Camilla Parker Bowles. This week we're still stuck in the 1980s but in an altogether better neighbourhood. The vicinity of the week ending 16th of November 1986. Spinning in at number 10, it's a really important record because it, along with the Beastie Boys, whose debut single was released here in March 1987, it's the record that broke hip-hop away from being a novelty music. Run DMC's team up with Aerosmith on Walk This Way. Regardless of how you feel about hip-hop or Aerosmith, it's a record that instantly gets the attention and illustrates that hip-hop devolved from what most people's preferred design of it was instead of the other way around. Note to all, I know that evolution doesn't work that way, but music arrives via a process of decidedly unnatural selection. At number 9, the good stuff continues. The planet Venus is the hottest planet, and a few weeks back, Venus by Banana Rama was the hottest thing on the top 40. Climbing to number 1 in the rare case of an original and a cover version both making the top, Shocking Blues version having held sway back in 1970. These charming lasses, who were basically where Stock Aitken and Waterman honed their craft before Kylie and Rick Astley came along, managed 12 top 40 hits in my old hometown, and this was the best of them. At number 8, it's a polarising song from Top Gun, Berlin's Take My Breath Away. There are basically two kinds of people in the world, them that like Danger Zone, and them that like Take My Breath Away. Both singles made number one, so it would seem there was little to divide the two in the public affections. Seven sees the inevitable crash with Christa Berg's It's a Joke record in The Lady in Red. Suffice to say, it was just about the wet noodliest entry in the entire disreputable history of Wuss Rock. It sold a gazillion, and you couldn't avoid it on the radio, except perhaps on the local communist anarcho-syndicalist station for Triple Z. Thankfully, Billy Joel is there at six to pick up an electric guitar and momentarily shed the impeccable sheen of craftsmanship over his songwriting with the tough sounding, tough talking, a matter of trust. I'm not ordinarily a fan of Billy Joel, but I do like the Bridge album from which this single is taken. Not as prolific a hit maker as one might think, Joel only breached the top 40 15 times, but this is one of his superior examples. They say you can have your own story, but you can't have your own facts. Rubbish. Here are the facts that are just for you in Fowl's fantastic world of facts. The biggest climber this week, up 17 places to 39, is a song I'd never heard of, or if I had, I don't remember it. Two of Hearts by Stacey Q. Um, now that I have heard it, I wish I could forget it. It made number seven, which along with her other hit from 1987, another number seven hit in We Connect, represented the entirety of her corpus operas. The biggest dropper this week are the band that trouble me deeply, Midnight Oil. If you can somehow block out the lefty loonies bleating of borderline moron Peter Garrett, then Midnight Oil are a tough, minimalist and driving rock and roll band. They do put on a good show, it must be said as well, when they aren't barking from the bully pulpit at their audience. This week's highest debutante was You Can Leave Your Hat On by Joe Cocker, the second step on a late career revival, first being the lacrimose lament Don't You Love Me Anymore, that saw the beloved old croaker regain his legacy. I always thought Civilized Man should have been a hit too. Oh well. And the longest running song on the charts was one time number two, Lionel Richie's notorious Dancing on the Ceiling, which had it made number one, would surely have been the worst number one hit ever. Brickhouse, this ain't. The number one hit in the USA was Amanda by Boston, which putted out at 25 over here. Nice video though. In the jolly old UK, the Brits spoke loudly as to which side of the danger zone take my breath away divide they stood, the latter in the midst of a four week stand at number one. 
Back home, number one album with the Groover and Boppers was Graceland by Paul Simon, but next week it would yield to the phenomenon that was John Farnham's Whispering Jack, which is still the biggest selling album by an Australian artist and was utterly unavoidable at the end of 1986 and most of 1986. We could go straight to number one here, but in the Righteous by Jambo organisation, we follow the rules of ordinal numbers. So number five it is, and it's the utterly brilliant Madonna in what was perhaps her first not so utterly brilliant moment. True Blue just seemed like a drop off after her magical run of singles had been extended by the first two singles from the True Blue album, Papa Don't Preach and Open Your Heart, just as the True Blue album, full of what could be called unsuccessful experiments or could equally be called filler, was a drop off from her first two albums. True Blue, the song is Motownish pop. Michael Jackson's later The Way You Make Me Feel sounds unnervingly but not litigiously similar to it, but it just seems Faye next to the dance pop tsunami she'd unleashed. To give you some idea of Madonna's dominance, of the first 30 singles she released in Australia, only two failed to make the top 40. Of the 28 that did, only three didn't make the top 10, and they were very early singles, and seven made number one. Compare that to Michael Jackson's first 30 singles, it's seven that didn't make the top 40, nine that made the top 10 and four number ones, and Prince, 10 didn't make the top 40, 8 made the top 10, and only 1 made number 1. Bruce Springsteen, well, he only released 20 singles, of which 9 failed to make the top 40, 8 failed to make the top 10, and they all failed to make number 1. Madonna ruled the 1980s. Number four, Paul Simon with his lead single from Graceland, You Can Call Me Al, dropped down from its previous week high of number two. A perennial denizen of the nether regions of the top 40, Simon hit the charts often enough, but much like Australian opening batsman Graham Wood, he seemed to struggle to get out of the 30s. And none of the three other singles from Graceland's even so much as troubled the top 40. Number three is Stuck On You by Huey Lewis and Elvis Costello's one-time backing group, The News, a band so bland and pointless they were featured in Brett Easton Ellis's American Psycho as the kind of band that titular psycho Patrick Bateman rhapsodizes over so that he appears as normal. Stuck On You just doesn't seem to have any great point to it, it's just unprepossessing music for the kind of people who want to have the right music playing and the reassurance that no one will notice what it is. At number two, it's the Communards with the towering Don't Leave Me This Way. Don't care much for the group name, but by gosh, this is a great record. It never made number one, but it was the biggest selling record in the UK that year. Jimmy Somerville had established himself as a genuine great singer with Bronski Beat, and here he takes it to another level. This and Venus and Madonna when she was on a game were exactly what was right about dance pop in 1986. Note, Stacey Q is a deliberate omission from that list. It's monkey time, people. The number one single lies just beyond the curtain, so let's have a tub-thumping intro by the one and only Monty the Safety Monkey. Go, Monty, go! Number one this week is John Farnham with his invincible, indestructible You're the Voice. Seven weeks atop the chart, only dropping down in the last week of the year to the mighty Pseudo Echo, who then spent seven weeks at number one with Funky Town, meaning Australian acts spent three and a half consecutive months at number one. Has that ever happened before? I'll ask about it. You're the Voice is a much contested song, taken up as it has been by anti-Islamic groups, much to Farnham's chagrin. There's nothing quintessentially Australian about it beyond perhaps Farnham's epic mullet, but these groups don't really seem like deep thinkers to me. Trivia piece, the lyrics to You're the Voice were written by the same man who wrote the lyrics to A Whiter Shade of Pale. And there we have it. It's 1986, I'm napping most of the day in an office where my job is to retrieve building floor plans for inspectors. I work with a guy called Dave who played bass in a band called The Karens, a guy called Rowan who's obsessed with bears and going through our card filing index and changing every instance of the word minister to the word monster, and a weekend crossdresser. 
I'm listening to Mick Caves, Tom Waits and the Dead Kennedys. I'm dating the six foot three redhead Miss Fifi, who is soon going to dump me for a painter who lived in Princess Street, Spring Hill, and whose speciality was huge blocky nudes rendered with a Soviet brutalism and oversized genitalia. And I'm about a month and a half away from meeting the future foul queen. Life was good then. Life is good now. Life will also be good the next time we meet in that foreign country of the past. Stay well until then.